absolutely love the film, but I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us today, and congratulations on such an amazing film. Oh, well, I'm very happy to talk to people who are that enthusiastic. That's brilliant. <laughs> So, Rachel, I guess my first question is to you, was when did you decide to make this journey that you were going on into a film? Was that, did that idea start very early for you, or when did that idea come about? I think it came from kind of understanding that this whole regenerative movement was, you know, had been very well documented on in books, like Charles Massey's book and uh, Tris... Um, Patrice Newell's book, and um, oh, there's a number of beautifully written books um, on the subject. But I really, what I really missed was the visuals of seeing the comparative difference between regenerative farming and conventional farming. What they talk about over the fence, where you can see the distinct line between life and death, and or you know health and and less healthy, or, or you just see the artifice of, of conventional um, agriculture compared to the naturalness of, of regenerative farming. And so I really wanted to see, and I wanted to get that out there, that visual, um, um, that visual opportunity. So, and also it was really sort of for my own empowerment, really, I felt so impotent at the beginning of this journey before I turned to regenerative farming, that I, I realized that I could not only be potent changing my farm, but as a filmmaker, I could document it. And also as a, as a consumer, I could change my, my buying habits. Definitely. So it was really those, those three things that, I, um, that really gave me an opportunity to weigh into this whole area. Definitely. And one of the things I said in my review was this film is also so honest, like going right back to the start of your journey, um, the film talks about the emotional space that you were in at that time. W was that something remarkably different for you as a filmmaker where you were part of the story and that your emotions were on the line for everybody to see? Yes. I mean, obviously that was... <laughs> A bit of a nerve-wracking um, element, but I knew that I, I, I mean, I tried to do it to start with without my involvement, that I was basically the silent um, interviewer, and I wanted to just talk to all the early adopters of this, of this way of farming, but I soon realized really that I couldn't make a sort of dry, educative um, um, piece, I had to bring an emotional, entertaining story into it as well, um, just in order to get that, to reach, to reach beyond. I, wa I really wasn't asking for this film to reach farmers. I wanted to reach the consumer. And in order to reach the consumer, it demanded a much sort of more engaging way of telling the story. And emotional journeys are always, you know, more engaging. And this Actually, I just did an interview with the Australian conservation movement, and they described it as a love story. And I kind of like that because it kind mm. of is a love story, love story to this land and a love story of, um, you know, to my grandson. And, um, you know, so bringing in all of those other elements, I think, does help to reach, a, hopefully to reach a wider audience. Definitely. Uh, and it did capture that really well. I, I grew up on a farm, so I'd always grown up with that relationship with a grandfather who would say, I will die on this farm and I will die for this farm. Um, and I don't think that's something that a lot of people who live in the city completely understand. Was that something that was important for you to capture with this film? No, not really. I think that's come to me over the journey. I mean, my attachment to the land, to this piece of land, grew as I became involved in it, as I started really opening up to this other way of engaging with the land. Yeah. And as a, as a regenerative farmer, you are have to be so alert to Mother Nature, really. You have to be reading all the signals that, that she is telling you about her health or her sickness and you know there are all sorts of little signs that you pick up on that tell you about where she's at and I've got you know and I'm not there yet um, and I'm beginning to sort of understand a bit like biggest little farm 
that there is a seven-year journey for nature to balance, particularly if she's been sick to start with. Yep. And I think, you know, I don't think I was the best custodian for the first 30 years of earning, of earning this farm. I didn't really pay enough attention. I didn't even... I didn't really even see her, see the land as, I saw it just as a substrate, as something to be taken from. I never really understood that it was a reciprocal agreement and that the more I allowed nature to do the work, the more she would do it for me. And I think we've got ourselves so into this position where we think we dominate nature to get the best out of her and that has certainly worked since the 1960s um, where we entered the green revolution and where we were using chemicals all over it to to push her to do um the things that we wanted and you know obviously there is like when you take those drugs away from a drug addict there is definitely a few years where you where you have to get everything in balance so that she is doing the work for you and that does sound a bit woo woo but my god when you start to open your ears and your eyes you realize that there's a real living entity in there and um and the more and that's incredibly exciting i was going to gonna- to yeah. actually be reading it. I, I was going to ask this question later, but it feels like the perfect time to ask it now. Um, how is the farm now, and how have you seen have you seen more changes since what we saw in the film as well? Yes, I think I'm seeing it consistent. We've got we're very dry at the moment, and we're in our winter gap, which is almost always our most challenging. But even after all this dryness, I can pick up the mulch that's on the top of my soil, and I've got pretty thick mulch on there and I pick it up and underneath my my gra- my soil is very moist and it's cool so and that from it from that everything else will come so I will get so much more um, microbes I'll get so much more ecology going on just by keeping the moisture in there and by keeping it cool mm-hmm. and that's all come from not slashing from using the cattle as my tools to move around the, 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 the pastures, to not overgraze, to, to um, use them, them as mobile composters, and so and also not to in them and them trampling too, so that I've just got this beautiful cover over my soil. So, you know, you just treat the soil with this respect and sort of bed it in so that it's at its most as it so that it can work at its most optimal. Definitely. Now, the other side to what I meant before when I said that this is such an honest film is that it shows that that transition from regular farming to regenerative farming is not easy and it can be stressful. I know for a lot of documentaries and a lot of TV shows out there, when they show a journey like this, they show the positives but not the negatives. Um, How important was that for you to capture that in the film as well, that that this is not an easy journey? Look, I think we've we've um, we've heard and seen so much subterfuge in the um, and, and hidden and hidden messages in the or well, not messages or just hidden facts in conventional farming. I mean, we're not told the truth about what is in our food and how our food gets to be on our table. We're not we're not taught about the shortcuts that are being taken and how. We are in how to get our food cheaper and cheaper. Our health and the ecology has, is being shortchanged. All we know is we want and all we demand is cheaper and cheaper food. And what does that mean? So I really wanted to show what that meant and to sort of to talk about how difficult, not how difficult, but it does need to change. And I don't think it's more difficult than the sort of farming that people do in, I mean, I ha- I'm not making more, but I'm not losing. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I've basically got the same number of cattle. I mean, we've had very bad seasons because we've had hugely wet seasons. And funny enough, you know, stock perform worse when you've got a lot of moisture on the ground than if they do, even if it's dry. So, you know, I'm farmers are always, um, as you would know, um, you know, being being going to boom and bust cycles. Yep. So that is ongoing. But they've done a lot of, they've got a lot of data now where they've taken examples of regenerative farming 
and compared them to um, the conventional farms. And the conventional farms have huge boom cycles, but their land, their soil is not resilient. So when we have, when weather is not with us, they suffer much more than those of us in the middle who are have transitioned to regenerative, and we've just got much more resilient land. So where they get huge profits in the good times and they put out their hand for government support in the bad times, we are just sort of in the middle there, less stress, less, um, um, less mental pressure, and we are just sort of trickling through to end up in about the same place. Definitely. Now, talking about comparisons, I wanted to ask a question that I'm sure a lot of the filmmakers out there who listen to this show would be thinking. How did you find it different making a documentary to making a traditional film like you would make? Uh, hugely different. Hugely different. A, um, or just the, just the, the pressure of being on film and having to be responsible for <laughs> telling this story. And particularly as I was very ignorant at the beginning, I knew very little about it. And, you know, so I was very daunted by the fact that I was going to have to be a spokesperson for regenerative ideas when I knew so little. Um, but, you know, obviously I was helped enormously. The gravitas of the film is very much in, helped by Terry McCosker, Charlie Massey and and Stuart Andrews and Tony Hill, you know, people who've been in this space for a long time. But I do think it was a really good idea that you showed someone who was asking all of these naive questions and discovering all of the, um, all of the, you know, the wonders, but also the difficulties in this journey. And I think that's, it, you know, I think that makes it very accessible to yeah. people, A, who are on this journey and all who are just, thinking about going on this journey, but also people to understand where their food come fr comes from and how uh, and how we're being shortchanged on the environment's being shortchanged and how we can change that paradigm. Definitely. Now, Rachel, I know we're right out of time. So just quickly before we go, what would you like to say to people out there who are about to go and watch Rachel's Farm in cinemas? I would say it's an incredibly hopeful um answer to some of those you know to our climate anxiety to some of those um seemingly overwhelming um um situations and events that are that that we've that we've endured like the fires and the floods i think it's a very a positive rectification of the way we do things there's not much we have control of but we really have control of how our food is grown and what we choose to eat and Consumers can make a huge impact in this area because they can make an effort to really find out how their food is grown and to support best practice farming. And the more we support that, the more we're going to see these changes. The more we demand nutrient-dense food, the more we demand that our, that our food comes free of pesticides, herbicides, chemical um, fertilizers, the healthier we're going to be, the healthier our land is going to be, and the, and, and the more we can actually impact um, and you know, so have, a, um, have an impact in, in, the, in this climate space. 